Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Business Day at World Travel Market and your host throughout, Declan Curry. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning and uh, thank you for your patience today and uh, a very warm welcome to World Travel Market Business Day, what for many of you will be the most important and constructive day of this week. I'm Declan Curry, I'm a uh, reporter and a presenter on uh, matters business and economic for the BBC. I've been uh, a business journalist with the corporation for about 20 years. Some of you uh, might uh, remember that I spent about a decade on breakfast television as its main uh, business voice, making me one of the many fat Irishmen that you see on television uh, first thing uh, in the morning. Um, it's a real pleasure to welcome you here today, and it's a pleasure to be here to celebrate your success, because that is what we are starting this segment with today, celebrating the success of the budding high flyers who will take this industry on to the next level in years to come and to introduce the World Travel Market Pride of Travel Award. I'd like you to welcome to the stage Michaela Juarez, who's Head of Marketing and Communications at World Travel Market, and Dan Pierce, who's Editor of Travel Trade Gazette. Ladies and gentlemen, in the next few minutes, we'll have much pleasure in introducing you to some very exceptional people in the travel industry. People who I guarantee you will inspire, encourage, and give you hope for an even better future for our industry. Just like last year's winner, Mike Monder, who I am delighted to say has joined us today. Mark overcame personal circumstances to run a highly successful and award-winning co-op agency in Llanelli, South Wales. We started World Travel Market's Pride of Travel Awards last year and were simply bowled over by the stories and the amazing dedication of the next generation of entrepreneurs and high achievers. These awards are the highest industry accolades that we can present. And to underline that fact, we are privileged to have one of Britain's foremost businesswomen joining us, Hilary DeVay. You'll know her as the latest star of TV Dragon's Den but that's just the tip of the iceberg. Hillary worked for a number of major companies before starting PAL-X, which revolutionized the sector, including Littlewoods, Tibet, Britain, part of the United Carrier Network, and TNT. Prior to the formation of PAL-X, it was difficult to transport small consignments of palletized freights quickly and cost-effectively. Hilary DeVay is responsible for transforming distribution in the UK and now increasingly in Europe by developing a business model that overcame this. Her success, though, has not been easy. She overcame incredible odds and faced untold hardships Bankers refused to give her a loan to start up the business, forcing her to sell her house and downgrade her car to fund the startup. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, please give a huge welcome to Hilary DeVay. Before Hilary hands out the honours, here is my friend and colleague, Daniel Pierce, editor of Travel Trade Gazette and our co-partner in World Travel Markets 
Pride of Travel Award. Daniel. Well, thanks, Michaela. Um, this has certainly proved a genuinely exciting new event. Uh, it's exciting because our respected panel of Pride of Travel judges, who spent a day in October going over the entries with a fine tooth comb, have been particularly struck by the quality of what they believe will be the next generation of successful business leaders in travel. Now, after meeting this year's nominations, it's clear that they not only care about what they do, but they're determined to stop at nothing to make it happen and to do whatever it takes, focusing on what's important and what makes an out-of-the-ordinary customer service that sticks in the memory and lays down the building blocks for sustained business growth. It's all about customer service, and our winners demonstrate that in spades. When we launched last year as the Pride of Agents Awards, we've evolved that now into the 2011 Pride of Travel Award. We've spread the net wider, inviting entries from all areas of our industry. Professionals in the hospitality sector, airlines, tour operators, car rental services, the list goes on. Our aim is to reflect the scope and the professionalism of one of the UK's very finest and key industries. Thank you. The WTM Pride of Travel Award is the leading national award recognizing achievement in the travel industry with a specific emphasis on customer care. This year we invited entries in four areas. Firstly, Pride of Business. It's been a difficult couple of years for a sector that's a key indicator of the wider economy. But the word is, this year has seen an upturn and at the forefront of those involved in providing the most demanding of customer service. Second, Pride of Leisure. High Street Leisure travel agents are too often written off as the dinosaurs of the industry, challenged by continuing technological advances that impact on booking trends. But ABTA's recent consumer trends survey showed 25% of holidaymakers booked through a high street leisure outlet over the previous 12 months. That's compared to 17% in 2010. Testament to the men and women who are at the cliff face when it comes to customer interaction. Our third category is pride of tour operators. Continuously challenged with confusion amongst customers over protection, never has customer care been more important than in this most volatile of sectors. And fourth and finally, pride of cruising. The boom sector of the industry with passenger shipping association figures showing a 6% leap in the number of Britons booking a cruise in 2010 and the PSA predicting that 1.7 million of us will be taking a cruise this year. Thanks in no small part to all those hardworking individuals who've sustained the popularity and success of cruising, offering fantastic customer service. It's from these categories our judges have chosen the best. Not only the winner of the title Pride of Travel Award 2011, but also a fantastic prize. Two flights anywhere in the world served by Qatar Airways, winner of the world's best airline at this year's World Airline Awards. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the WTM Pride of Travel Award 2011. So ladies and gentlemen, as you can see, a very, very uh, competitive uh, award to win this and uh, an achievement uh, not just to win, but even to be nominated. And I know a number of the nominees are here in the room with us this morning. So if you can give them a round of applause as uh, a mark of their achievement of making it this far today. Um, also, a, a thank you to Michaela and to Daniel and also to uh, Hilary. Thank you very much. Hilary, we'll hear more from you uh, later in the morning. So, in this uh, tough 
climate, this age of austerity, what does it take to be the winner of the Pride of Travel Award? And why is it so important that we recognise the achievement of the winner? Well, we asked our judges. It's been extremely difficult this year to decide on a winner because there's been so many good entries. Um, and, a, and across the board, uh, the quality of the entries, particularly in relation to the customer service, has been first class. I think what's been really encouraging and really impressive is the high standard of entries this year. Um, reflecting on the levels of customer service and the level of business that's being delivered through the travel and tourism industry and that's got to be good for the industry as a whole. It sets a benchmark, it sets a standard. We all know that in 2011 uh, trading is such a challenge, uh, not only in travel but across uh, every business sector and it's at times like this that the, the added value you can provide with, uh, with true customer service uh, and truly looking after your customer, it's a time when that really comes to the fore. So, so this award and, and recognising customer service is, is more relevant than ever. I think customer care is the most important thing in the travel industry. Without customers and repeat customers, we don't have an industry. And it's amazing how resilient young people, especially in the high street, actually care about their customers and get them to come back. It's real credit to them. Oh, I think it's extremely important that we recognise these achievements. It's a difficult market and I think everybody has to work very hard on getting the customers dealing well with the customers and then retaining the customers. I think one of the reasons why I, I particularly like these awards is that so many awards in the travel and tourism industry are geared towards companies and organisations, whereas these awards are absolutely about the individuals and the people behind those companies and it reflects the passion and the commitment that they do and put into doing their jobs which then reflects on the customer experience and also in terms of the business overall. And I think that's what makes them particularly special. Now, just to give you uh, an idea of the high calibre of uh, entries, uh, I've been looking uh, through some of the uh, citations that the judges considered, and I'm going to share one or two of them with you. There's a business agent who uh, told us how uh, they'd gone above and beyond the call of duty when they found that a client had lost a necklace from New Zealand uh, whilst on a trip to the United States, the necklace of huge sentimental value. Now, the client had telephoned the hotels in America that she had stayed in, but to no avail. So the agent contacted not the American hotels, but the tourist board of New Zealand to track down an identical necklace to the one that was lost. And the agent did this at his own expense. Uh, another entry that was considered by the judges this time, uh, a leisure agent who uh, told the judges how she'd helped a family on holiday in Spain when their two-year-old son was knocked over and injured by a car. That agent helped that family get an extra night stay at their hotel and arrange to uh, change their flights with British Airways at no extra charge. Initiative, personal service, going the extra mile. These are the qualities that make winners. So what qualities were the judges looking out for in particular? Here's what the judges had to say. We chose this particular winner because they really exemplified everything that is in an outstanding travel agent. Somebody who engages very personally with their customers, gets to understand their customer needs, the sort of holiday that they're looking to experience and to match that accordingly, that keeps in touch with them throughout that holiday engagement and follows up afterwards very personally, but as a consequence of that gets more customer feedback and as a result of that is more likely to get business um, following through from that as well. I think the winner showed great judgment of character. The person worked very hard in providing a service, went the extra mile and that's seen for what the customers have actually said back in their emails to the agent. First class. The winner for me epitomised three things. One was really understanding what the customer wants in the first place and making sure that they get the holiday that is actually going to suit them. Secondly, being there to give them support if they need it, if things change or if the itinerary changes or if things go wrong. And thirdly, really following up afterwards and building that relationship because repeat business is actually 
in some ways the easiest business to get and I think uh, the winner exemplified all three of those. The winner was chosen because of exceptional customer service, building customer loyalty, very high repeat business levels and exceptional commercial performance. I think the qualities we were looking for was, uh, was, a, was a, a travel agent or a travel person that clearly exceeded the expectations of their customers. Uh, and obviously travel agents do so much uh, anyway for, for customers as part of the job. But uh, what we really wanted was a travel agent that did more than, uh, than would have been expected. Uh, and certainly this winner has demonstrated that in spades. The selection of this year's winner, I believe, demonstrates to the thousands of travel consultants that work in all the different channels to market within our business that if you put the effort into good quality customer service you will achieve a high level of sales, an exceptional level of sales. In this case nearly six times the normal average of customer sales delivery and you will have a high level of repeat business and you will bring success for your company. So the judges describing the one entry that stood out above all the others. This year's winner was praised by the judges for the remarkable way in which she had linked excellent customer service to her business success. Nothing was too much for this popular home worker who achieved more than £2 million worth of cruise sales in her own right last year. This year's Pride of Travel Award goes to... <laughs> Joe Rigby from Thomas Cook Cruise. Joe, many congratulations yes. from uh, everyone here. I, I was looking through some of the um, uh, some of the feedback you got from your own customers. Uh, if you'd like to just step in just a, a little here, there are a number of things that stood out. First and foremost, among them, personal service. Uh, Hello, Joe. It's very nice to receive personal service. The little touches are the ones you remember. That was uh, Hilary and Graham who got a a card from you before they went off on their journey. Talk, talk us through what you mean by the service to customers. Every single customer gets a have a nice cruise card. Um, every customer gets a birthday card. If it's an anniversary, they get an anniversary card. Um, they also get a welcome home card as well. Um, and a lot of my customers are, you know, friends as well now, even though I only speak to them on the phone. Um, and that's what it's all about, really, getting to know them more and doing anything for them that will help them to enjoy their cruise. Uh, and something that also stood out in, in, in the comments from your own customers was your knowledge of the places they were going to, of the product that you were selling. Um, yes, I must admit, I'm a bit sad. And um, I only cruise on my own holidays. So um, I've been on over 40 ships. Um, I book my cruises at least two, three years ahead. Um, I do information sheets on areas that I've been to. Um, at the bottom of my signature, I put all the cruise ships I've been on, the future cruises, and I'll do my monthly newsletters with information on, for example, you know, next month I'm going here. If you want any questions about that ship or about the area, let me know and I can help you. And how are you feeding today as the winner <laughs> of the Prime Travel shocked, Award? Really. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't expecting it. No. If I can get you to stand just over here okay. a little, I'm going to ask uh, Hilary to uh, join us back on the stage to assist with the presentation of the award. There we go. And if you want to just come round here, and there is the award. Ladies and gentlemen, another round of applause for the winner of the Pride of Travel Award, Joe Rigby.
Uh, and that is the uh, award for this year. A big thank you to uh, all the uh, nominees and to everyone who took part. Thank you also, of course, to uh, or the sponsors of the award. That's uh, TTG and Travel Channel and also Qatar Airways. Uh, Pride of Travel Award uh, resumes again in 2012. Uh, we'll now move on to the uh, next part of the business session here, which is the meeting on par talk, how you can grow and expand your business in these tough economic times. We've got a, a panel of experts to share their experience and their advice in a few minutes, but first uh, we will hear from uh, Hilary Deve as well on how to win through the tough economic times. Hilary Deve, whose career can only be described as extraordinary, the determination that she has shown in rising to the very pinnacle of her own career and also becoming a broader ambassador for business throughout uh, the UK uh, and uh, not forgetting, of course, her appearance on Dragon's Den. Ladies and gentlemen, another welcome, please, for Hilary Deve. Thank you, Declan. Thank you, Michaela. Declan, I don't think you're a little fat Irishman at all. I think you're very warm, chubby and cuddly, darling, and just stay as you are. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm proud to be amongst and addressing you travel, you travel professionals on this symposium. I must say, when I saw the calibre of the audience and the profiles of my fellow, fellow panellists, I feel privileged to be here. There are just two things that are mandatory whilst I'm stood on this stage. Are you all listening? The first is that you clap where appropriate, and secondly, that you all continue to smile and laugh in the appropriate places. Otherwise, I get terribly nervous. My name is Hilary DeVay. DeVay, Declan. <laughs> I've been with him on working lunch, you know, and he didn't get it right then either. <laughs> I'm the founder, owner, and chief executive of the Palix Group of country, Companies. Countries, I wish I was. Um, I'm also a shareholder in another of other smaller businesses. More recently, however, I've become totally, by default, a TV presenter, associated with programmes like The Secret Millionaire, well, that's no secret any longer, is it? Indeed, after 22 marriage proposals, 9,800 begging letters, it finally dawned on me that the cat was out the bag. In fact, one brave soul, well, he was a really nice, kindly gentleman, actually. He wrote to me, sending me a CV. He professed to be 72 years of age, but, ladies, wait for it, with the body of a 36-year-old. <laughs> could I resist? It convinced me, could whisk me away and bring me happiness forever after. Indeed, he sent me a daily itinerary for the next six months. Apparently, I was to attend his bowling days on Wednesday afternoon, his darts matches on a Thursday evening, his dog-walking club on Fridays, all of this in the luxury of his three-wheeler Reliant Robin. <laughs> Albeit, he did concede that I could, and I quote his, not my words, servants, inverted commas, with me on the days that we would have to use the disability bus. <laughs> this same gentleman, he just wouldn't take no for an answer. And he actually turned up one day at Palix HQ with his statements showing six and a half thousand in credit in his bank account. This would keep me in luxury for the rest of my living days, he said. Reluctantly, although I did consider his proposal very long and hard, I felt I had to decline his kind offer. God bless his soul. 
The Business Inspector was the next TV project I was involved with, and this was great fun. But moreover, taught me a lot about the rationale behind SMEs. I went into a wide range of businesses, from pole dancing schools, dog groomers, hauliers, cocktail bars, go-kart racing tracks, florists, etc., etc. And now, as you're all probably aware, more recently, I've taken on the role of being a dragon in BBC Two's Dragon's Den, receiving pitches from a wide variety of entrepreneurs. The one thing that being on the television and being involved with a raft of small businesses has taught me is that there is a commonality throughout every business model. In the case of the business inspector, firstly, they was all losing money. And secondly, none of these businesses had any marketing or sales expertise within their organisations, nor any brand awareness. None of the business owners understood their costs or what direction the strategy or strategic development should be going to within their company. To me, it was common sense, and it was all very relatively easy to turn around. I was brought up a publican's daughter, and believe me, my father had an uncompromising work ethic. You work, you own. You work harder, you earn more. This was instilled into me from being five years old when my beloved dad put a chart on our kitchen wall detailing all my jobs for that week and how much I would be paid for them. As I was saving up at the time for my first horse, it certainly incentivised me to do my jobs well and do more, as the more jobs I did, the more I earned. Indeed, by the age of 11, I could take my father's dictation in shorthand, type the required letter, run a hotel reception desk, take and confirm the bookings, and run a bar single-handedly, including cashing up and reordering the stock. I never went to school, mine. <laughs> and, of course, balancing the tills. My father thought that I was a girl and that I would learn more from working with him. He's probably right, of course. And, of course, I learnt the art of shouting, Time, gentlemen, plays, please. Last orders at the bar. But seriously, from all of this, I learnt very valuable lessons and ethics, which I still practice today in my everyday life. Today, ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you about my own experiences of building, running, and perhaps, more importantly, developing my business, Palex, which I founded in 1996. Now then, I support, suppose you're all wondering how on earth did a mere female like me get involved in haulage? Such a male bastion world. Dirty, greasy lorries, which sometimes combines itself with dirty, greasy men. Indeed, I've often wondered this myself, and I've come to the firm conclusion that it's because my personality lends itself to dealing with the weaker sex. <laughs> men. <laughs> Only joking. We all know who the boss is, don't we, ladies? Hmm. Whilst I've had a lot of laughs along the way, I'm now of the firm conclusion, and bearing in mind I'm surrounded by men all day, every day, in all capacities, but I'm now of the firm conclusion that men will only act rationally when all other possibilities have been exhausted. <laughs> I bet you hate me in this men in this audience, don't you? But I love you all, really. The concept of pallets came to me whilst working as a consultant for a major retailer, endeavouring to establish for them a haulier's nominated carrier scheme. It was whilst I was visiting a haulier in South Wales 
and overheard a traffic traf uh, overheard a conversation taking place in their traffic office. They were discussing transporting just three pallets consigned to go to Carlisle. The traffic operator quoted the customer 12 working days delivery time scale. And I thought, Christ, I could get it there quicker by donkey than that. <laughs> but all this was before the concept of the hub and spoke, i.e. the pallets concept. Before pallets, what hauliers would have to do is fill their vehicles as best they could. So after they'd had a customer phone them and say, I want three pallets to go to Carlisle, they'd then all sit around in this huge desk, in this huge office, furiously phoning everybody, every haulier, every customer they got, and say, have you got any goods to go to Carlisle? Or en route to Carlisle? This would probably take them three, four, five days before they got sufficient freight to fill their vehicle to send it to Carlisle. Then the amazing thing was, once they got it to Carlisle, they then had to do exactly the same thing in reverse to get it back full. I came away from that meeting and I was absolutely bemused by these enthusiastic traffic operators making these laborious phone calls. And I just came away with my head buzzing and thinking, there's got to be a simpler way. There has got to be. After uh, that, that meeting happened on, a, on Friday, and it was in Cardiff, and by the following Tuesday, I knew what I had to do. If I could establish a central distribution hub in the middle of the country and formulate a hauliers membership network, each haulier only collecting and delivering freight within their own postcode area, and only using articulated vehicles for night trunking and full load distribution, what a metamorphosis this would create. Not least for the hauliers, who traditionally work on 2% margins, but equally for the customers, who could then consign freight in small consignments to anywhere, anywhere in the country and expect them to be delivered overnight. So from Carlisle to Cornwall, have it delivered the next day. The cost savings to the hauliers, the retailers, the manufacturers, and by no means least, the environment would be incalculable. I only pondered the concept for 48 hours, by the end of which I knew that my new baby was going to be born, nurtured, and furthermore, would succeed against any and all odds. Within a month, I had done all my research. I'd studied the demographics of the country, and I'd ascertained that there was over 10,666 hauliers registered with the Road Haulage Association in 1996. I needed just 35 of them to get my hauliers membership network up and running. Sounds very simple when you say it like that, doesn't it? So, I wrote my business plan and off I went to see the bank manager. I'd calculated that I needed 112,000 to start my business. And I'd really worked hard on this business plan. And so I was excited, really, really excited. I thought, you can't possibly turn me down. I knew every single answer he was going to throw out me. And I sometimes now, you know, relate it back to some of the pictures we see on Dragon's Den. And I think, Christ, I did better than that with the bank manager. <laughs> However, my euthoria was soon to be diminished as I sat in front of that bank manager, who I often think of today as an utter and total misogynist. He patted me on my head, told me how many new business startups fail, and that as a female in a man's world, particularly one that was a single parent, he didn't believe I had the slightest chance of succeeded, succeeding, and no, he wouldn't loan me any minute money, and no, he wouldn't even grant me an overdraft. As I walked away from that bank, I was even more determined than ever that I, I would succeed. My own pride had come into this. 
I would raise the money myself. So I sold my house, I sold my car. In fact, I sold everything, except being a lady, of course, myself. And, of course, my precious son. One of the things I remain very proud of, even today, is that that first business plan I wrote traded pound for pound and pallet for pallet for the first three years of my business's life. So, now I had raised my money. However, I was now in the situation where the only accommodation I could afford was a rented flat, which was above a fish and chip shop. Sometimes handy, sometimes not. The flat had underfloor heating, but that disappeared at 10.30 at night when the chip fryers were turned off. <laughs> and ladies, and I'm serious, and ladies and gentlemen, this was in the days when there were real, real winters. You know, when I looked round at night, windows were not the only things that I covered with silver foil something that my father taught me. If you cover the windows with the silver of the foil to the inside, then it insulates the window and stops the ice forming on the inside of the window. So I covered all my windows with silver foil. And then I'd look at my child in bed, and he'd look cold. So I covered him with silver foil. <laughs> and then when you look at your child lying in, in bed, trussed up like an oven-ready turkey, it hits you that either you must be what the bank manager claimed to be, mad, or in my case, bloody seriously determined to succeed. Strangely, the only male I had in my life during this time was the seven-year-old who called me mummy, and the final demands for gas and electricity that dropped through my letterbox that first Christmas of trading. Ladies and gentlemen, it was terrible. I'd opened for business on the 29th of November, and after I'd paid my staff, I had less than one pound left. Oh my God, Hillary, what am I going to do? I'd got a, a child of seven who'd been promised a big red shiny bike for Christmas, and I thought, how the hell am I going to get him this bike? So I did what we all do, girls. I phoned my mum. And I said, Mum, would you like to join me for Christmas dinner? Of course, love. Good. Lovely. Love to. I said, good, Mum. Will you also bring the dinner? Of course, love. Also, could you bring a bike, a big red shiny one for your grandson? She laughed. Of course, love. And of course she did. God bless her. The second-hand car that I bought took me 50,000 miles across this damp little island during the four months that it took me to set up Palex. Believe me, there are 126 postcodes in Great Britain, and rest assured, I visited every single one of them during my quest to build Palex. However, I must pay tribute to that little second-hand car. It did refuse to keep going at times, but he'd also refused to be beaten. And the one advantage of having meetings with transport companies, what do they always have on site? Is mechanics workshops. So whilst they were fixing my little car to go on to my next appointment, I was having meetings with them, convincing that my transport revolution was the thing, best thing that could happen for their own businesses and they set out repairing my car. I didn't set out to change male perceptions of women working in the transport industry. That is just a happy byproduct of my work and the respect I have earned. I spent most of my life in logistics and transport, and I truly believe this is the first lesson. Know your market. Much as I hate to admit it, that bank manager was right. More than 45% of new business startups fail. Why? Because of lack of funding, lack of knowledge, lack of planning, etc., etc. The first distribution hub that I set up, which basically was all I could afford, 
was a Second World, Wo World War aircraft hangar based in Wimeswald Airfield in Leicestershire, middle of nowhere. It had no running water, no electricity, so what did I do? I compromised. I hired a generator, hired in some porter cabins, and then I hired two chemical portaloos, which I shared with 50 burly lorry drivers and fork truck drivers. Believe me, ladies, when faced with that dilemma, you learn excellent bladder control. <laughs> Just tell me, gentlemen, why is it that you can all pride yourselves on going into a pub and throwing a dart at a dartboard and getting it to land within a millimetre of where you want it to, <laughs> yet get you in a toilet cubicle and you can't bloody aim it from two inches away. <laughs> I just fail to understand it at all. Perhaps one of you will let me into the secret later. Everybody that visited me on that airfield had to bring a bottle of water with them so I could make a hot drink. If they brought me two, I thought all my Christmases had come at once. I believe that another lesson to be learned is do not be afraid to break the mould. By God, I have and still do. I've always tried to differentiate myself from my competitors, always remembering that one only has two unique selling points. These should be synonymous with each other, your product, service and yourself. Remember, business people like ourselves do not have all the monopoly of good ideas. Be prepared to have some downright daft ones. And believe me, I'm no exception. Sometimes my enthusiasm runs away with me. I remember one such occasion a few years ago. By the way, our corporate colour is silver. At a board and management meeting, I came up with what I thought was a rather nice idea of clothing our fork truck drivers and lorry drivers. Of course, you all know I'm fashion conscious anyway. And I decided that, you know, silver safety helmets and silver boots, that's statically, I thought they would look rather swish. I explained this to my male colleagues who sat opposite me with the big beer bellies out in the silver palace ties that I bought them to wear. And a brief silence ensued in the meeting. My colleagues looked at the shoes, fingernails, the feet, anywhere except at me. And then one brave soul, who is now my managing director, said, bloody hell, Hills, they'll look like some bizarre cross between Playmobil and the village people. <laughs> Needless to say, we kept our uniforms to more conventional colours, but they did appease me, appease me by getting me a diamante covered high-vis jacket with shoulder pads, so I was happy. Corporate social responsibility plays a very important part, both in my personal and my company's ethos. Indeed, I introduced a charitable donation of one pence per pallet movement. Her Royal Highness, the Princess Royal, whose charities have been the beneficiaries, have stated that the idea was truly innovative. My own experience of engaging in an ethos of giving to charitable causes via my business, not only inspires the directors, but also engenders and enthuses the workforce and engenders team spirit. Equally, I believe, particularly today, it plays a vital and important role in our society. As I stand before you today, Palix has diversified its activities, both within the UK and far beyond. Why? because I had to. In 2008, we hit a recession, and I knew that I had to have lateral thought, and lateral thought process and diversify to keep my employees employed. That was my sole purpose, was to keep all my loyal employees employed. So instead of contracting my human resource and scaling down the business, I expanded. I expanded marketing, PR, human resource, and IT. 
I implemented a projects team that would take us into Europe with every conceivable language skill. Money well spent. In 2009, Palix Italia was launched, with hubs operating near Milan and Naples. In 2010, we launched Spanish, Portuguese and Romanian networks. It is anticipated by the end of 2011, Palix France will be established, and in 2012, we will establish networks in Bulgaria, Germany, Benelux, Poland, and, to and Turkey. My vision is a total pan-European network for Palix within five years, and I'm investing heavily into the business to achieve that goal. I'm also hoping to take the business model to the United States, Canada, and Australia, as we have been shown interest already. I have a range of other diversification projects in the pipeline. In fact, a dizzying number of them. No one can accuse me of resting on my laurels. I'm involved with WOW Table Art. My name, because it is WOW. And I'm branching out further into the events industry. At first, I thought, Hillary, what do you know about the events industry? You spent all your life in the logistics sector. And then I thought, no, of course I can do the events industry. Business is business. Cash flow is cash flow. Balance sheets are balance sheets. P&Ls are P&Ls. And projections and business plans are written in much the same way. And the events industry fits perfectly. Because like the logistics sector, it is right time, right place, with the right resources. And when you consider that, it applies, the same model applies to any business concept. I'm very proud to say that since my involvement with WOW Table Art as a 50% shareholder, I've turned that business from a £280,000 loss to a £500 profit this year. But again, I will think laterally, and this business will not only have legs, but wings, and I'm in the process of fly flying it across Europe and worldwide. On a similar note, one of the businesses I invested in on Dragon's Den, Shoot It Yourself, is widening its current scope in the wedding market into the corporate and events market. It is also, and I have to be circumspect because of confidentiality agreements, entering the travel market, offering services to organise team travel. The, all the world over. This is only one of the many ways I'm ensuring that failure is not an option. Let's face it, what group of travellers would not want their own professionally edited DVD as a memento of their trip? We've been approached by such travel organisations and my business partners at Shoot It Yourself are young, enthusiastic, full of acumen and raring to go, and they're in current discussions endeavouring to conclude a package. They will achieve this. But, ladies and gentlemen, this is what I mean about lateral thought and uptrading in this difficult economic climate. The simplest things in life will bring about ideas. It takes an open business mind, tenacity, willpower, passion, to turn these ideas into profit-making ventures. For instance, whilst flying back from the States recently on Upper Class Virgin, I was trying to sleep on one of Richard Branson's seats. It was very hard and I did not get much sleep at all. So I began to ponder how this element of his business could be improved. And another Dragon's Den investment I've made came to mind, called Duvalet. I looked at Virgin's paper-thin mattress cover and thought, what they need is a Duvalet, a tempore mattress within a duvet. Fitted to the seat, and wow, I could hear the Zeds. Subsequently, I commissioned a template for his planes. I've written to him personally, requested he trials the products, 
and I dare him not to. Because if he doesn't, some other airline offering first class travel will. I then thought about what else the product could be used for. Boats, camper vans, truck sleeping cabs. And again, I'm still in the process of bringing all these markets to fruition. The travel market is yet another market where we'll be investigating. And the Duvalet will be a great USP for many travel companies. Who else could have thought of this? The fact is, any one of you could. But the reality is, I did. And I will bring all these to a profitable conclusion. So my message to you all, especially owners of SMEs, is to keep your minds open, be tenacious, thinking about adding value to the services you already offer, which from the short time I sat there listening to the awards, many of you are doing just this, and I think it's fantastic. But I believe if you do this, we will all survive through what is commonly become renowned as the worst economic downturn in the last 50 years. But, for God's sake, let's not make this a self-fulfilling prophecy. Let's stay focused on survival. If we do, I believe we'll all, we will all survive. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for allowing me to share some of my story with you today. I hope you haven't found me too boring. I expect now a resounding no. <laughs> my story doesn't end here. In fact, it's just beginning, but I'm not going to go on. I've just finished my autobiography, which will be on the shelves next year, and I hope you all go rush out and buy it. <laughs> I will now join my colleagues, if Declan will assist me, and hopefully try to answer all your questions. God bless you all, and thank you so much for listening. Hilary, thank you so much for uh, sharing your experiences uh, with us. If there are questions for Hilary that you really want to ask right now, then stick your hand up and catch my and we'll try and get uh, a microphone to you if you want to ask them. The, the, the point that you made that stood out most for me was the, when you talk about the need for lateral thinking. And that's not just you and your business, that's every business owner in every industry. It's very difficult though if you're running a business day to day and you're caught up in human resources and payroll and actually the operations, to set aside the time that's needed for that lateral thinking. How do you do that? Well, Declan, I think it depends how many hours a day your brain's in operation and mine's in operation 24 hours a day. So I've got a habit of even putting my head on the pillow at night thinking, I'll do that. And, you know, my, my management team and co-directors aren't unduly worried when they receive an email from me at 4.30 in the morning. <laughs> They must love that. So, uh, well, no, they're used to it by now. Um, you know, I, and even doing the most stupid things, sitting in traffic, window shopping, um, going out shopping on a Saturday, um, whatever you do, going out for a meal, will spark some idea. Just keep your brains open. And you've written to Richard Branson. I've written to Sir. So, so have you, has he replied yet? Uh, no, he hasn't replied, but I had a letter from his PA back within four hours to say she was forwarded to him immediately. So, so when, he, when, when he writes back, it'll say, Dear Hilary, I'm a 70-year-old man with the body of a 35-year-old. <laughs> and I'll say, yes, please, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't have sent you that letter, should I? <laughs> right. Um, if there are any questions, stick your hand up. We'll get a microphone to you. Otherwise, we'll uh, uh, sort of carry on with the uh, rest of the uh, event 
uh, this morning. We will uh, carry on then. I'm sure there'll be more questions for uh, Hillary and for all of the assembled panel when uh, they join us here on the platform. Uh, there is no doubting, as, as Hillary herself acknowledged, that these are uh, difficult and tough times. Greece cannot repay her old debt. She cannot afford the interest costs of new loans as well to carry on spending. So it's relying on the multi-billion pound international handouts from its neighbours. Because Greece can't repay, banks which loan Greece money in the first case are going to lose over half their money. They are facing substantial losses. And because they now need to restore their finances, pumping millions more into their reserves. Shareholders of the banks will be asked to uh, stump up some more. They may be unwilling or unable to pay, forcing governments into bailouts that they say they can't afford. And to stop lightning striking twice, to stop a rerun of Greece for the banks, those banks are now charging more for loans to Italy and to Spain. Italian borrowing costs went above 7% yesterday, above the level that triggered bailouts for Portugal and Ireland. Now, there may not be an immediate crisis for Italy. It doesn't need any substantial borrowings until next year. But if those borrowing costs don't fall in the interim, and there's no guarantee that they will, Italy may herself need a bailout from its neighbours, a bailout that Europe clearly cannot afford, which is why China, Brazil and Indonesia are being asked to help. Europe's leaders tried to solve the problem of their rescue fund not having enough money by not conjuring up any new money, and it has already come unstuck in a week. So what is the impact of that for you and for your business? It's another squeeze on bank lending as they fear new hidden losses that uh, the banks they do business with. There is a fall of confidence at companies, some of which are stuffed with cash, refusing to invest or spend on stock and new jobs and new expansion. A fall of confidence too among consumers as they cut spending and pay back debt. And that leads to a drop in growth. We've seen it across the continent of Europe, a slowdown in growth. That has snuffed out the limited recovery here in the UK, feeding fears of a double dip of recession. But behind those headlines, there is a much more textured, a much more granular story. Every week on the programmes that I present for Radio 5, I meet British bosses and entrepreneurs who are growing their businesses by 10%, 20%, 50%, over 100%. Percent. For them, austerity presents opportunity. Opportunity at home and in Europe as they take advantage of weak arrivals. Opportunity globally in a world where China has expanded by 160%, not 60, 160% in the last five years. Where Indonesia has grown by 150%, Brazil by 135%, India by 100%. So that is the context in which we have our discussion about how you grow your business and how you fight to survive. And I'd like to invite our fellow panellists to the platform for that discussion. They are Steve Byrne, David Jones, Chris Foti and Caroline Rifkin, if they'd like to take their places here on the stage. And as they uh, make their way up, let me tell you just uh, a little bit about them. Steve Byrne is uh, Managing Director of uh, Travel Counsellors. He's helped steer a UK travel business into a major international concern. His story is one of growth and then more growth and then more growth on top of that. David Jones is the uh, Chief Executive of ETAG, which you'll know is uh, the European Tourism Action Group. He has decades of experience as an industry leader at an international level, concentrating in youth and student travel. Chris Foti is a partner at White Hart Associates. He's a specialist in tax, auditing and accounting, uh, also an expert in corporate finance. He's the, the guy you go to to stop you going bust in tough times. And Caroline Rifkind, uh, Senior Manager in the Travel Division at PricewaterhouseCoopers at PwC, well, she's the one you go to if you are just about to go bust because she is the one who does well out of recession. She's trained as a chartered accountant and has over a decade of experience in business restructuring and insolvency. Uh, and of course, uh, Hilary, how do I say your surname? Devay. Thank you, is here as well. Declan Sweetheart. 
Thank you. <laughs> Let's pick up this uh, initial thought then of how you grow your business, how you find opportunity, and also how you cope with the business climate. Steve, if you can pick up the, the context that I set out there, remarkably gloomy, even for a financial journalist, almost Robert Peston-esque uh, in its uh, outlook. Yet business carries on and opportunities are there. So how do you continue to run a business in that economic climate? I think it's tempting to turn the TV off and ignore all the doom and, doom and gloom, but I guess you've got to be attuned to it. But I think you've, you've heard the answers this morning. Um, I think there, are, there have been four things that have stood out for me uh, so far this morning that are very revealing in terms of what it takes to be, to be successful. And, and the four things were, uh, were these. Hillary said, you need to be clear what your strategy is and where you fit strategically. And I, within travel, I think the market has become polarised. And you either need to excel at one or two things. You either are super transactional, and that's about volume, and it's about price competitiveness, and about transacting at a significant scale, or it's about being fantastic at service and building connections with, uh, with customers. And we heard a great example of that, mm. that this morning, of tapping in into what people inherently want from their travel provider, which is to tap in to their, their emotion. There was a survey recently of uh, the top 50 things that make people happy, and 10 of the top 14 were things associated with booking a holiday or going on holiday, and that's a huge advantage to us. So I think strategically you need to be in the right place, either super transactional or super emotional and building relationships with, uh, with customers. You need the hard work and resilience and focus and grit and self-belief to make it happen, and ideally be part of a company and a culture that facilitates uh, that. The third thing, and I think probably this is the single most important thing, but uh, I'm open to be challenged on it, and Hillary mentioned it, it's about having some very clear ethics about what you are about as a business so that you've got a clear sense of purpose that is a central point around which your staff and your customers can rally, can rally around. And over the course of the past months, we've seen businesses and individual brands fall by the wayside because they haven't got a clear sense of, of values. And the final thing, uh, and, and just as important, perhaps, is having the people to put into practice that strategy and those, and, those, and those values. And if travel companies had a culture that attracted more people like the winner this morning and put them at the heart of their business, if that became the norm, then you can thrive and you can excel in this market. That's my passionate belief. Yes, uh, uh, Joe being an excellent example uh, of that, uh, and that's the reason she won the Pride of Travel Award today. Uh, as well. I'll pick up the uh, point on service in uh, just a moment. Caroline Rifkin and then uh, Chris Foti, if I can bring you in on this thought as well. Businesses that don't make it, what mistakes do they make? I think one of the, the things for me is, and, and you mentioned that the insolvency work that we do also, probably 50% of my time is, is dealing with businesses that are facing some sort of financial distress and looking at how you might deal with that situation. And for me, one of the, the key points is all about information. And it's understanding who your stakeholders are, whether it's the regular, whether it's the regulator, whether it's your lender, whether it's investors in your business, and actually knowing what information they want and how to present that information to them. I mean, it was echoed by something Hillary was saying when she was talking about the investors that, that, that come into the den. And actually, you're, you're looking at all these various parties and wanting them to trust in you and give them the outcome you want but they need to have that visibility to understand your business. So information, for me, is one of the key things that, that businesses need to be thinking about. And Chris, the reason I ask about what mistakes do those that fail make is because it's possible that you can remain successful in business by learning from the mistakes of others. Yeah, you can learn from other people's uh, failure. I'm, I've seen a lot of businesses that have failed over the years. I've seen some that have come back from the absolute brink. I've helped companies come back from the brink. One of the things I couldn't help but pick up from, from Stephen's comment was his passion about his business. If that passion comes across, then you can motivate others to take that journey with you. But I would underscore the point that both Hillary and Caroline have made. The key point that Hillary made when she started her business, she had a plan, she had a structure, she knew what she wanted. She stuck to that plan, I think she said, for three years, pound for pound. So many times you go into a business and they don't really understand what their goals are. 
And quite often you ask them for financial information and it's not available as quickly as it should be available. And the worst thing you can do when you come into a distressed business is to be told, I run out of cash tomorrow. Well, you must have realised cash uh, was deteriorating. What's your cash flow like? Wh are you monitoring it on an almost a day-by-day -day basis in difficult times? There's no reassurance for any investor, regulator, bank, credit card company or whoever to support your business if you've let it get to that stage before you've started hitting a few panic buttons. So it's more than just running the business efficiently, it's knowing the intricacies of the business and its financing and its cash flow. Absolutely and marketing is a key aspect of that. You want to drive business one of the biggest failures I've seen of businesses is that their, their bookings are not coming in, market's slowing up, so what do they do? They just double and triple their marketing, thinking that's how to bring business in. Big, big mistake. That's how to burn money even quicker. And Hilary, you have that grasp on your business. We actually run daily flashes and, you know, I think I'll be supported by my colleagues. It's far easier to turn a bad month around than it is to turn a bad year around. And a lot of the SMEs, certainly, that I've been involved in generally have external accountants that actually produce counts from once a year. They've lost 150 grand and they don't even know they've lost 150 grand until the accountant tells them that. And I think, you know, it's not rocket science today. There are plenty of software packages out there that will provide you with the financial information that you require at the press of a button within hours. That's right. And the profile of a general travel entrepreneur is selling. Mm. and to get across that need to have somebody in-house who's telling you how you're doing. And remember, you know, the travel industry spikes when it comes to cash. So if you start your business, you're flying through the summer, if you've not got your management accounts, you don't know where you are, all you see is a pile of cash in your bank account. That's why Caroline will tell you most summer operators fail in the September-October <coughs> period when the cash runs out. I was going to say, echoing one of the points Chris was making about, about marketing spend and, and the point about travel businesses typically being cash rich, there's that desire in difficult times to spend and spend and spend to get yourself out of it. Now, in some circumstances, that might be appropriate, but it's about recognising, actually, when you're looking at those daily flashes, those weekly flashes, that you're starting to face some problems and actually looking at whether you can protect your balance sheet and start to invest some of the money that you've got in, in, in supporting your business rather than necessarily trying to spend your way out of it because that's it's quite a high-risk strategy. But I, I keep hearing an argument from other entrepreneurs who say that uh, be, uh, the point where you are in trouble is the worst time to cut back on selling the business, on promoting Not the business, that you need to retain a presence in the, cu in the customer's mind. I think, uh, particularly in travel, it depends whose money you're using to invest and grow your business. <laughs> if, you're, if you're prepared to take an equity stake and put some of your cash at risk, then, and that may be the appropriate strategy. I mean, we talked about the difficulty of businesses getting banks to lend to them. As, as Chris said, with, with travel businesses, th they are quite cash-rich bi businesses, but it's not necessarily the resources that should be invested in growth. Sorry, Steve, I know you want to get in, but I, I heard you mutter under your breath there, not... Well, no, I, I just think that, you know, if, if you're prepared and you can approach your bank manager and say, um, in November, there's my business plan. And, you know, it, I think it's always wise to redo your business plan. I mean, we do ours at least three times a year. You know, we start one at the beginning of the year, we'll readjust it after the first quarter, we'll readjust it after the second quarter. And fortunately, I've got very, very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, accountants that are not optimistic and I, I think that's the key you know I, 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 think, I will I actually say you know look um, in 2008 we thought right what's worst case scenario I'd spoke to all the banks Mervyn King and they're saying don't expect any green shoots before 2012 so I thought right worst case scenario 25% down on revenue, 25% down on volume. So let's do our budgets, let's redo our budgets, let's see what we've got. And, and then let's see how we can apportion. What, yes, we lost some heads, but there were heads that we didn't obviously need. 
And what we then did was with the rest of the money was reinvest in a strategy and a, a strategy of growth across Europe that would replace that revenue ultimately that we were going to lose in the UK. I don't think there is a, a word for gloomy accountants. I think they're just called accountants. <laughs> so that that's a, um, David, we've not heard from you. I David, was going to say depressing, but... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would say we've been here before in, in September 2001. We, we had these kind of panels. I remember sitting on them in September 2008 for different reasons. We, we had panels like this. And if we look back on those things, it seems to me that the, uh, those who survived are those who were able to innovate. And that, that was the actual core uh, you know, the thing about the, uh, that, that distinguished them from those that didn't. For SMEs, there are huge advantages in, in innovation right now. It takes, they're able to move quicker, they're more nimble, they can move with less capital, they can, they can maintain and implement strategies with less capital. They have greater access today than they ever had before for technology, so we're all moving into cloud computing. And in fact, as SMEs, today we have access to systems for free or for, free or for very little money that can run our small, medium-sized businesses, but can actually run very large businesses. So, so there is, uh, they're close to the market, they're close to the customers, which is essential today to all that value and, uh, and, and relevance we talked about in the awards earlier. And, and I think two other things are key to this whole. I, I believe the, the second one um, does have to do with being aware in the marketplace of where the resilient sections of the marketplace are going to be and where the growing parts of the business are going to be. Now, I came out of youth tr student travel for 15 years, the global organization. We were 550 uh, organizations in my membership. And, and we were lucky because that was a part of the industry that delighted in downturn because as the, if, if the prices went down, they traveled. And, uh, at, but, it, uh, but it has more to do than that. I mean, it, and what I heard in the last two or three days around, around uh, World Travel Mart is that one of the, one of the most uh, impressive trends is that in the growth that people say will continue to happen, uh, it will be towards things like independent travel. SMEs are all over that. I mean, that is the market that SMEs can get to. And the direct relationship that we have with our customers now through tools we didn't have in 2001, for sure, which is social networking, et cetera, are there today. And the last point I would make, uh, which I think is key to, the, to understanding today, is to, is to structure our, our industry. I mean, organizations like ETAG that I chair is a, is a consortium, effectively, of associations representing the industry. And that's everything from tour operators to uh, hostels to amusement parks to tourism guides to Eurogy, to people like these. And, and through those industries, and, and, I think, and I don't have to tell you people about this because you're the ones who are already ahead of this curve, being here in these kind of sessions in World Travel Mart and working through your associations to give you uh, information and access to, to the industry that is, is equal to small, for small industries as, 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 opposed, as well as large ones. So, there is, so, that, so the industries are a great leveler for, for SMEs. And you can actually access all sorts of things through your industry associations that, that give you kinds of resources you need, give you the market intelligence that you need, give you the tools you need, the skills, the best practices, and give you the representation you need. And also to, to wrap your brand in things that are going to matter more and more to consumers. Even in times of trouble, people are concerned about responsible travel. They are concerned about sustainability. They are concerned about the environmental impact. And by grouping those things into your brand, that's true innovation. And, and you have the tools to speak directly to your customers to social networks, and we have web tools to market the access that SMEs didn't have 10 years ago. Lots there to unpack over the next half hour. A reminder that, uh, of course, it's your questions that matter uh, here uh, in this discussion. Uh, as the practitioners in the industry, as the people best placed to uh, ask the pertinent questions, uh, do uh, stick your hand up in the air until, uh, and keep waving it around until I see it, uh, and we'll get a microphone to you. Feel free to join in the discussion at uh, any point you want. So we're trying to uh, look at some strategies for survival, how you can uh, maintain the core of your business uh, without uh, losing the things that make your business viable and profitable and uh, unique relative to your rivals. Um, Steve, that means that you keep an eye on cash, you keep an eye on information, but you don't cut back on things like the standard of service. You don't cut back where possible on range. So dealing with this economic climate isn't necessarily retrenchment, it's simply a different ways of doing things. Well, I think you need to be smart about it. I think Hillary, uh, as advised before, was 
was spot on. I mean, difficult times, you're going to go bust because you run out of, run out of cash. So the one great thing you can learn from uh, a bank, and we've got some bankers in the, in the audience, and I call my FD the Grim Reaper, and I want him to be the Grim, the Grim Reaper. We produce a budget. Oh, and, met Derek. Yeah, you've he met is. him, yeah. <laughs> and we knock 20% off it. So we run our cash based on things being 20% worse than we actually expect them to be, so that we know we've got nice and tight, we've got headroom. Uh, headroom in it, but then once you know you've got that nice and tight and you've got the management information to know where you are, then you have to carry on running the business, knowing that you've covered your, covered your downside. And what you always do in business is you cover your downside, whether it's about people or technology, you cover your worst case scenario, and then you get on with running the business. And one of the reasons why I think travel companies get tempted to ramp up marketing spend, especially when times are tough, is that because We've, we've got a temptation to focus on the customers that we don't, we don't have and get more of them, rather than focusing on the customers that we already have and getting them, get them to come back to us. When Sir Terry Lee took over Tesco, I had a market cap of five billion, the same as Sainsbury's and Marks and & Spencer's, and 13 years later on, I had a market cap of something like, was it 60, 70, 80 billion? You know, he did a number of things, but one thing that he did do, he placed recognizing and rewarding existing customers at the heart of the at the heart of strategy. And one of the great things I think you can do as a business is to look at get a high level of customer retention because they are cheaper to look after and they'll be more loyal and they'll be greater advocates for you, reducing the reliance on marketing spend to get new customers. Sure, but that didn't stop them going after new customers as well. No, absolutely. You can do, you can, you can, you can do, you can do both. Uh, but it's a question of how you prioritise your, uh, your resources. And if you're aggressive and if you're assertive, you will try, you will try and do both. But you wouldn't try and do one or one or one or other. I, mean, I think my point is that in a recession, the temptation is to go and focus on the customers that you don't have, that your competitors might have. And yes, that's important. But it's, I think it's a risk not to focus on the customers that you've got to increase retention and to increase and to increase advocacy and have a system in place that actually measures and tells you what your customers actually think think about you. I think it's arrogant in business to assume that your customers. Uh, like, like you, and you need a measurement uh, of, of that. We use Net Promoter Score, uh, and that's used by 50 of the Fortune Top 100 US, uh, US businesses, so that we know, you, you need to know that your business is rooted in the here and now, because if you lose sight of your existing customer, then you will see cash drain away. I take the point, but when you look at the World Travel Market Survey of UK, UK consumers, the survey that came out on Monday here this week, 38% of UK consumers didn't take a week-long holiday last year. 38% of the population. That suggests that there is a huge pool of people out there who could be potential customers. Uh, yeah, but I've not... I think, I think, so why, I think so why as, a, so as a strategy of growth, why shouldn't you go after that? No, no, that's not my point. My point, my point is, though, you don't do that at the expense of looking after your existing customers. Ah. What is the point in running a business when you've got customer retention or repeat business of 5%. So 95% of people who use your service wouldn't choose to use you again. Hmm. And then you're going to go and spend the fortune to get more customers. Go and do that, but let's get our existing business right. Because that's a measurement of how well you're doing now. If you're not doing that well here and now, then the next customer's not going to stay with you ever. And you're in a vicious circle of spending and spending. And the only winner, and they might be in the room, the only winner in the travel market doing that is Google. Because that's how you're going to get your new customer. Hilary, how do you strike the balance between uh, looking after existing customers and retaining them and I think, seeking I think it's important that every business of, 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 of any magnitude runs some kind of risk reg register on their customers. And, and I, I quote, like, for instance, um, in my own market, we would run a risk register on hauliers or companies that we trade with blue chip, so we run a financial risk register, an operational risk register, and you know we know week by week, well, hang on a minute, there's a debt there, and it could, it's looming, you know, so we've got to act very quickly. In the travel market, perhaps they don't have that as much because it's more free flow of cash. Um, but nonetheless, you could run the same risk register by saying how many are coming back to me. Which goes back to our earlier point of it's sort of always management control easier and control to of cash. up trade with your current existing customer mm. base than to spend what can sometimes because you know marketing is 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 very very 
it's, it's never totally definitive. You know, you can have the best marketing strategy in the world and it may not gain you anything. And, you know, it, you don't know that until you've actually spent the money and measured your response. So, you know, the safest way in a recession is to uptrade, to, to try and offer or add USPs to the existing packages that you've got and to entice your customers to return back to you year after year after year. Why? Because you're good, because you care, because you ask the right questions, you know, because they like you. You know, to me, that is just common sense. It's not even business sense, it's common sense. But how do you encourage people to spend more money with you at a time when they want to cut the amount of money they're spending? No, because not necessarily. They won't. It depends what USP you put with that package, doesn't it? And if they can't find that with a competitor, or because they already know you and they're already loyal to you, nine times out of ten, they'll come to you and think, brilliant, my agent's now doing X, Y, Z, so I'm definitely going for that this year. Steve, you wanted to have another nibble of that. <laughs> you make them feel special. I mean, you had an example of it this morning. You make them feel special, they'll come back to you. I mean, I think we're getting, there's a risk in, 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 the current, in the current market, we make the assumption that we play to the lowest common denominator that the customer's looking for the, cheap, cheap, the cheapest price. The customer's looking for value. Yeah. It's a combination of service and, uh, and, and price. There are some just looking for price and they'll probably go online. But the sort of customers that you want that are going to come back to you and are going to advocate what you're about and be referred for you, they're looking for value. So you need to make them feel special. Yeah, if, if, if one of your clients is prepared to spend £599 on a holiday, but you can offer a USP and take that to £650, then... A, you've added value to your customer, you've added revenue to your business, and you've added something a little bit more special to that customer in your business. And Chris, behind all of that is the idea that you've taken business from someone else, that you've taken advantage of a weaker rival in a recession. Well, over well, the last two years, there have been a, a lot of travel failures. That's an opportunity in itself, that, that, that there are extra clients out there who, don't, who can't give repeat business to the travel company they lose, la used last year because they don't exist. But going back to your point on th the 38%, uh, you're looking at Stephen saying, well, now, how, do you, how do you attract those people? I would suggest there is enough variety, enough USPs, <laughs> enough range of selling for those people to have booked. The reason they didn't book, travel is a discretionary spend and they use their discretion not to spend any money. Why? Because of the feel-good factor. There's a lot of people out there who can afford to travel, who aren't travelling. They're doing exactly what those companies are doing who are stockpiling their cash because they're being brainwashed left, right and centre by the media. The Double-dip recession, what's around the corner, what will next year bring? We've got our Prime Minister saying we're staring down the barrel. Our Chancellor saying it's Euro meltdown within six weeks. You know, these things affect people when they come to a discretionary spend. Governor of the Bank of England saying it's the worst uh, economic conditions that he can remember in his lifetime. That's right, yeah. And that, and that gets reported and circulated and that 30, those 38% of people are going to tread water till they isn't, feel yes. better. I, I wonder isn't the problem that he actually said it rather than the subsequent reporting of it. A bit of both, I guess. Mm. OK. Um, I'm keeping an eye out for uh, your questions as well. If you want to ask them, we, put your hand in the air. If you could tell us who you are and where you're from, please. Um, hi there, panel. I'm Andrea. I run a company called Shoot It Yourself. Um, I'm one of the investments that ah, Hillary one, made. The one you mentioned, yes. On Dragon's Den. Um, Talking about USPs, Hilary, and to the rest of the panel as well, as a young mum, and also I run a small to medium business, I booked a holiday recently for my family, and I went on the basis of a company that had a video on their website, um, and it wasn't actually on their website, so it was on YouTube. I'd looked up on TripAdvisor, there were lots of photographs of the holiday, and then I Googled it, and there was somebody had posted their video, and it looked brilliant. And I booked on that basis, and I had an amazing time because the video really reflected um, the experience that that person had had whilst they were there, um, rather than what some glossy, you know, magazine had said about it. Um, and I just wonder why in the past video perhaps hasn't been used as much in the travel industry, because as more and more people move away from television and onto the computer, and I, in this age, as you said, Declan, of, of um, social networking and blogging, tweeting, Facebooking, video, I think, is going to be a massive, really, really powerful tool 
to serve as a USP against other travel companies. And that's why I think um, Hilary mentioned that we would like to go into that eventually as, as an offering where people can take our cameras for group travel. We'll professionally edit their video for them to give you the USP um, in, in terms of selling the package and to give the client something tangible that they can come away with and say, look at my amazing trip, only cost me an extra £50 pounds more. Do you think there's a market okay, for that? Thank you. The, po the point we get. Cool. Well, Marshall McLuhan said the medium is the message, and, that, and, and the reason <coughs> it's popular now is because uh, social networks have allowed it to be popular, and that's, a, and that's a trend that will continue to grow, I would agree. So it's uh, smarter marketing rather than more expensive marketing? Whichever of you wants to take the point. Well, I think, I think the reason why people have not taken it up is that we've probably been as an industry slow to, slow to in, innovate and also it's, ex, it's been expensive to do because the way that it's been pitched is that the travel company commissions a company to go out and, and, and do it and what, what you're doing reflects the change in nature of the, of the market and that you're empowering the customer to, to, to produce it and you'll see that great brands that will thrive and prosper are those that empower the customer to have a voice and, uh, and, and engage with them. The risk with uh, with it, and I'm speaking from a parochial point, point of view, is that uh, most video material at the moment is, isn't, isn't created by the personal, personal user. So the video experience may not actually reflect what you want as a customer, and therefore I think it's important. I think it's important that your offline experience and your online experience is, uh, is similar, so you don't disappoint in either, uh, in either channel, but there's no, power, no more powerful validation in making sure that this discretionary spend that you value and look forward to is right for you than someone saying to you, you've done all your own research, you've looked at the video, but I know you, you've got to trust me, and this holiday is right, is right for you. And that's why I think the personal service and the care will still be central to what we do. But we need all of these other things wrapped around it. I, I, I agree a thousand percent with you because I believe it's a unique selling point for my own firm. If you want to go on our website, we have a video. You'll, you'll see me talking, which is a bit of a downside, I suppose. But we have a video, whereas our peers, not many of our peers of similar size do. So I think it's an, an, an excellent idea. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, hand over here. If you tell us who you are, sir, and where you're from. Uh, Raphael Pittman, Authentic Britain. Um, do you agree the term entrepreneur applies to startups, SMEs, and corporations? That's the first part of the question. And secondly, how can we, uh, how can enterprise culture be promoted against the background of cuts in bank loans, government spending, and education? Who'd like that? I'll do that one. Um, I absolutely agree with you. The travel industry was based on entrepreneurs. The greatest travel brains are travel entrepreneurs who have grown with the business. Travel's got way too corporate, in my view. And the reason for that is quite simple, for all of the reasons and more that you've just mentioned. Innovation is being stifled by the extreme regulatory framework we have in this country at this time. Travel is the second most highly regulated uh, industry after financial services. The barriers to entry now are huge. They are also unfair. Unfortunately, on the holy grail of consumer protection, we have anti-competitive uh, rulings from our government regulators. For instance, if you want a CAA Atoll license, not only do you have to pay the £2.50 APC, but for the first four years of your existence, you have to bond as well, and yet you're competing against giants for the same customers. It's anti-competitive, but the government hides behind the Civil Aviation Act and other similar things. So I agree 100% with you. Entrepreneurship is being stifled in the UK. The innovation is not there. We've seen some tremendous innovation in travel. But you look over the last three, four years, it's dried up. And I'd like to think that government would take heed of that. Unfortunately, the government, when it comes to the travel industry at the moment, thinks it's a surrogate for collecting taxation. APD, Flight Plus, the VAT running around, even though they've lost a recent emotive tribunal case, still collecting the money as if they were right, even though the courts have indicated that they were wrong. So I would like to see more travel entrepreneurs coming through, but boy, to start up a reasonable sized travel business now, you need a lot of money. Hilary appears to want to say something. I do, because I've got to emphatically disagree. 
I mean, coming from an industry where I'm in, where um, there is no industry in the world with more legislation attached to it or more costs attached to it than transport and logistics. You know, you, to, to run HGVs, you've got to have an O license. To have an O license, you've got to have cash in the bank. How do you expand your business? Because it's all capital assets, it's rolling stock. So it's exactly the same, and there are still new companies starting in logistics, so I totally disagree. I think it's more of a question of lateral thought press, thought process, and a lot of hard work. And, you know, in, in, I've done a kind of white paper study, which I've actually sent to the government, and, you know, requesting why is it that Britain has incurred in the last five years a 25.6% increase in fuel duty, why Germany incurred 0%, why Spain incurred 5.7%, while France incurred 6.2%, you know, so... I'm awaiting so, those responses. So allowing for inflation, could you start your business again now with 112 grand? Yes. Well, I think... But bearing you, in mind, I, I did it myself. Was it 1996, did you say you started your yeah. business, or was it earlier? 1996. Well, in 1996, it was a lot easier, a lot cheaper to start up a travel no, business than it the, is, the travel business than it is now. Yeah, I think any business was probably easier in 1996 than it is now, but, I mean, that wasn't the question, was it? The question was on about the onus of legislation and the cash flow requirements attached to each respective industry, and I think those are appropriate to any industry, really. Steve I think one of the, one of the challenges we're facing in the industry is, uh, is we're losing talent. As a recent report came out, a lot, a lot of people are lead, uh, leaving the industry. Don't see it's got a... Uh, it's got a future, but I, I, I do think, and I'm, I'm throwing this out, out for debate and to be challenged, I think there is a big distinction between people who can run a business and people who can create a business and, and create, create value. Uh, I think entrepreneurs are different. They have a different uh, mindset. At the end of the day, they have the proverbials, and I watch my language, to put things on the line no matter what the cost, because they've got that inherent belief that they're going to make it happen, and they will overcome all obstacles along the way. Not many people are able to do that. They are special, and if we spot them, we should be able to nur nurture them, and I think the legislative framework doesn't actually help all that much, but there are lots of people in industry who have disposable wealth that's been accumulated over years, and if we can use that to encourage more innovation and more entrepreneurship, then, 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 then we should do. Like ideas like we've heard about, heard about this morning, because that is the future of the travel industry. The future is about personalisation, making it personal, just for you, startups. That's where the vibrancy and ideas come from, and the great brands of the future will encourage that and not stifle it. Thank travel, you. travel Council is one of the greatest examples of a business that was started by an entrepreneur with drive and passion, David Speakman, who um, is uh, your boss. And uh, he was also a client of mine. And I think, you know, Travel Council is living testimony to what an entrepreneur can do. Admittedly, he's expanded his management team, got extremely good management in, looked after what he started. But it wouldn't be where it was today if it wasn't for the man. OK, thank you. I can see a couple of hands. I'm going to ask for the uh, question from this lady, first of all, and then it'll be followed by this gentleman here. Uh, Hello, lady thank you. Over there. Go ahead. If you just tell us who you are and what company you're representing. Um, I'm an entrepreneur. My name is Viviana Garside. I uh, opened my business six months ago. And I'd probably like to ask the panel to uh, give me some advice, what uh, I should consider, what I shouldn't. Uh, my business is very, very niche, very, I've really thought about it. Uh, I've got a business plan, I've done all my forecasts, I know where my cash is, I have had no bookings yet, but I'm looking forward to the new year to sort of start doing that. We're working on very creative marketing strategies, and my background is marketing, digital marketing. Um, but obviously I see there is a lot of competition. Uh, we, we only focus in Latin America, because that's, that's where we think the growth is going to help us. So just, you know, a little bit of advice will be very welcome. Thank you. Hilary, give her some encouragement there. Right. <laughs> Tell me again. Small business specialising in marketing, right. so targeting when, Latin America. When, when did you have your electric moment? When did you decide that you were going to um, open for business? Um, 
I've really been thinking about this for a long time, so it's not it's not something I. So is the business now currently operating? It's operating. We have a website. We've started marketing with advertising. But you've had no customers. Uh, uh, we've had interest, but obviously not no not customers yet. What does that tell you? How long have you been operational with a website? What does what is that telling you? The fact that you've had no customers? the decision making is longer. Our, our our prices are quite high. Obviously, we 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 go into a completely different audience. We focusing on the wellness part of of, of, of of the leisure industry, and to a very different part of the world, which is Latin America, which always seen as a adventure travel. But there are opportunities there for. Um, wellness, there is the infrastructure, you have Peru, you have Brazil, Chile, uh, you know, countries like that that have to offer to the consumer. And the people I have been speaking to are very interested, they, they have different needs. So obviously we are a tailor-made company, very small. Uh, we obviously look at our costs into uh, trying to invest as much digital as we can because we can't afford to print bigger brochures like bigger companies do. So, um, yes, I know it's tough times coming, but uh, uh, I am positive about probably next year and look at how things will come out in the new year. Okay, thank you. Have you looked at collaboration with other companies and perhaps integrating your package with some of theirs? Um, we, I, we, we are part of LATA, which is the Latin American Travel Association, so we work, we are, we are members and the, there are um, um, plenty of activities that LATA does so people can talk and discuss about issues. So that's one, of, one, one part of that uh, that we've looked into, but not <coughs> partnering with, with companies uh, like competitors, no. Uh, what are your projections? Um, in terms of revenue for the first year. Revenue orders. Yeah. Um, we were looking at the first six months, uh, well, obviously looking at January, uh, from January to, to March, to have uh, um, 15 bookings per month, which uh, an average yield, of, with an average yield of uh, 3,000 to 4,000. We are a small business, our costs are extremely low, so we can maintain ourselves like that. Having a, our initial forecast uh, showed um, a revenue of 2,500 pounds uh, for the first year, but that will need to be revised once we have... Because you've got bookings. nothing yet. Yeah, we don't have any bookings, so we don't have any actuals to look right. at. Thank you. Um, Steve, sorry. I mean, I'd, I don't know whether you've actually started or you're waiting, if you, or you're waiting to the new year. If you wait to the new year, I wouldn't wait to the new year. I'd start, I mean, start now and yeah. get stuck into it. To me, it sounds like you just need to market, market, market like hell. Yeah. Whether you're marketing direct or marketing to the trade, you need to market, market, market. And if I was you, I'd be going to the opening of an envelope. I'd be at everything, getting my name out there, opening doors, selling myself in, selling my business, knocking on people's doors, all the things it takes to start up. Start up, start up a business. If you really want a leg up, then try and partner with a travel agency group and a consortia that can uh, leverage your brand up to loads of independent and agencies to give you that customer base, to give you that, to give you that credibility. Bad market, market, market. Whilst watching your costs. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Um, sorry, Hillary, did you? No, right. No, I just no. I wanted to uh, ask David. I mean, the... That was the whole point mm. I was trying to make about collaboration because. Um, if, if, if you've got now kind of nine months down the line and, and you've now had no orders, and I think I would go back and review my marketing today because you've clearly done something quite wrong, um, or you're not shouting loud enough about the brand or you've no brand awareness. And if the easy route to getting that is integration into other companies, then that's, I think, the route I'd be taking. Uh, David, the broader international point, given the rates of growth in places like Brazil, uh, the instinct isn't wrong, that that's uh, an emerging and increasingly important part of the world for, for this industry and so many others. Hmm. And I think, um, I mean, in your case, I think your background will help you, because I think it is the way to get into uh, markets these days. I do think uh, you do need to understand everyone else's product that's doing something similar to you, make sure you understand why you're distinctive, then get that that message out. I mean, a lot of the uh, talk this week has been about the emerging markets in the BRIC countries. I mean, that will be a massive great uh, force on the industry. Uh, what we know, what we know now is that it, it tends to happen in fairly structured group patterns, but there will be 
uh, very quickly emerging out of that, a set of travelers coming out of those countries that have very specific habits. And to understand and know what those habits are, the people that are operating on the, uh, into the uh, opening up the new niches coming in or out of those markets will be where there's lots of opportunity for small and medium sized enterprises because you can then play off the volumes by taking those people that then start to go off and travel more independently. Your, your business of uh, wellness is one of those kinds of niches. Understand the rest of the niche, get your market out, and, uh, yeah, and shout it out loud. Okay, thank you. We've got uh, two hands in about five minutes. So, uh, this gentleman here, and thank you for your patience, sir. Thank you. Um, my name's Philip Scott from Can Be Done. Uh, we're a niche tour operator. Um, I just wanted to comment on the question of regulation. Um, I don't know anything at all about the haulage industry, but um, I think the comparison between regulation of the haulage industry and of the um, travel industry was not necessarily quite um, <coughs> excuse me, accurate with the greatest of respect because what Chris was talking about was the consumer protection which affects um, the travel industry, whereas the, the licensing of a haulage operator, as far as I know, is really compared or could be compared with the, the licensing of professionals like accountants who have, and lawyers who have to completely um, you know, keep up to date with the regulation, and if they don't, they're going to lose their practicing certificates. Okay, thank you, sir. Point taken. I don't want to get into a my regulation is bigger than your regulation. No, no. Uh, <laughs> spit fight. Uh, there was a hand. Did I see one along the row here? Yes, the gentleman in the front row, if we can get the microphone to him. There we go. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, hello. Uh, my name is uh, Parish Raghani. I'm a corporate trainer for Five Star Hotels. The question was to Hillary. Um, I think, obviously, most people know that uh, you sacri sacrifice so much of your sort of, uh, you know, uh, self-pleasures in 10 days in sort of run-down Rochdale and gave about, I think, 160,000 to community projects. That self-sacrifice, putting others before self. I mean, um, sort of, what's your major, why you do what you do? What's your major motivation? Because that is a lot of sacrifice in the joy of others. Okay, it was, thank you. It, it was actually, it's turned out to be more like 350,000 actually, because I've continued to support, support site community base and backdoor project up until last year when they got funding from lottery funding. So it's actually, and I am still in touch with those people, but mainly because I think what goes around comes around, and I think I'd like to leave a legacy to say that. You know, I have given back. And, you know, I know I'm, I also know I'm very fortunate to have made the money I made. 50 years ago, people worked down mines for 15 hours a day and didn't see the light of day and could barely put bread on the table. So any of us that do make it should give back because not everybody can do that. Thank you. Uh, Steve, it shows that corporate social responsibility remains important even in austere times. Yeah, well, I think it's a, I think it's a fancy word, and it's got all things things wrapped into it. But if you, you know, if you read Warren uh, Warren Buffett, who draws on W. Clement Stone, who, who draw who drew on Dale Carnegie, these people have a huge sense of uh, they have a huge moral compass uh, about them, and they inherently believe that business can be a power of good in the world. And too often we for, uh, we, we forget that, and that's what I meant at the start of the at the start of the session, that fantastic brands are based on individuals. They've got a deep sense of what is right or wrong, and they live and die by their, by their values. And whether you're a small business or a large, a large business, I believe that's fundamental to what, to what you do, having that sense of, of good and of, and of value, because A, it's right, and it's spiritual, but also people will rally to you. You will appe appeal to people like that, and you will turn people off who don't like that, which is great too. And that's a great thing for recruitment. It's a great thing for you getting the right type of, type of, cust type of customer. But great business leaders, you'll find, have got that deep sense of value. OK, thank you. Um, I'm going to ask Caroline Rifkin for some uh, sort of concluding uh, thoughts on uh, how you fight to survive in these times in, in just a second. Uh, I'm aware that there are more hands over there, but I apologise. We, we do need to finish at one o'clock and it is fast approaching that time now. So, um, Caroline, if I can give you the um, sort of the, the, the last word on this, the, the point of this discussion has been fighting to survive. Um, I think there have been some very good points made um, sort of around the room in the questions by, by, by the various panellists. Um, and, and the ones that particularly struck me are about 
understanding your market and knowing your customers and knowing exactly what they want. I mean, one of the things we do at PwC is we do a consumer survey every quarter and we ask people about how their spending habits are changing um, in response to the economic climate that they're finding themselves in. And the message that, that we're getting told at the moment will come as no surprise to anyone who, who follows what's going on, but it's all about the, the non-discretionary items are costing people more and therefore they've got less money to spend on the discretionary products such as travel, such as eating out, such as discretionary shopping items. And therefore, for a travel company sitting here looking at how they can protect their business and grow their business in, in the current climate, it's really understanding which segment of that population you are aiming your product at and actually what are the, the drivers that are driving how much they've got available to spend and talking about and looking at whether you can actually sell them the same thing that you're selling them and retain their custom potentially by looking at your pricing structure, looking at the add-ons, what, what else they're getting, or whether, going back to, to the marketing angle, you need to be investing more in retaining your current customers so that you can protect the business that you've got. Okay, thank you very much. A terrific uh, range uh, of uh, insight over the last uh, hour or so. Can I ask you to uh, thank all of our uh, panellists, please? Steve Byrne, David Jones, Chris Foti, Caroline Rifkin, and, of course, uh, Hilary Glover. Just uh, two little bits of housekeeping before I release them. Uh, first of all, uh, Joe Rigby, our award winner, there she is. Um, if you could uh, remain along with uh, Hillary and also the representatives from TGG and WTM, uh, we'd like to take some photographs with you. Uh, also, if there are any uh, other nominees uh, in the room, if they'd like to remain behind as well, uh, we'd like them to take uh, part in those photographs as well. And just to remind you that in this room at half past three this afternoon uh, is the big talk. You'll hear from Keith Williams, the uh, Chief Executive of British Airways, uh, and also be able to put your questions to Frank Vanderpost, who's the Head of Brands at BA. Thank you very much for your participation, and uh, may the day be profitable. Thank you. <laughs>